already got a long statement, so I'm not going to go into that at this point. Uh, I'm going to support Judge Slaughter's nomination, so I want to speak about Mr. Mathis. Uh, the Tennessee senators worked to find a nominee who they could support. They put forward Judge Camille McMullen, a state court appellate judge who had been appointed by a Democratic governor. Unfortunately, uh, this administration refused to work with them, uh, voting to move uh, Mr. Mathis' nomination would condone uh, the administration's process uh, in this case. That process caused the White House to miss out on a valuable feedback from Tennessee senators who know the legal community in that state. When I was chairman, I made sure the White House had meaningful consultation with members before moving forward. The senators have valid concerns about Mr. Mathis' lack of federal appellate experience and his lack of attention to detail. He made an unusually high number of mistakes in failing to follow the Sixth Circuit rules. Some of those mistakes might be small, but the people of Tennessee aren't going to see it as a little thing if details get missed in deciding their cases. Some have also suggested Mr. Mathis may be moderate on the bench, but he is a fairly junior attorney with a short record. He hasn't worked on cases involving major constitutional issues. Unlike the candidate proposed by the Tennessee senators, he has no body of judicial opinions to review. One thing that we can look at is evidence of his judicial philosophy is the article he wrote in law school. In it, he advocated for federal courts to adopt a new standard for habeas court cases. Uh, as Senator Hawley explained at his hearing, that theory of habeas review is radically outside of the mainstream, so his scholarship doesn't support the claim that he would be a moderate. Because of these concerns, I'll be voting no. Uh, turning to the bills that are on the agenda today, so I won't speak again when these bills come up, uh, I'm, I'm a co-sponsor of the Earn, uh, Earn It Act, this bill makes uh, an important step in holding online service providers accountable for very horrific sp uh, spread of child sexual abuse material. I've long uh, been a supporter of victims' rights and have fought for efforts that stop the spread of child sexual abuse material. Uh, in 2018, I co-sponsored the Stop Enabling Sex Traffic uh, legislation, commonly known as SISTA, uh, which is uh, designed to hold website operators accountable when they knowingly facilitate sex trafficking. After news reports emerged of sexual abuse of young amateur athletes in 2017, our committee, uh, during my chairmanship, convened a hearing on this subject. Uh, I later worked with my colleagues on bipartisan legislation that would make it mandatory for instructors, coaches, and others who work with young athletes to report cases of child sexual abuse to the authorities. I led our committee in reporting this bill, known as the Protecting Young Victims from Sexual Abuse Act, to the full Senate and was later enacted. It's important to find ways to stop the spread of exploitative and uh, sexual material, and this legislation does just that. This common sense bill received unanimous bipartisan support in the Judiciary Committee last Congress, and it's time that we get it on the books to prevent more child exploitation. Eliminating uh, the eliminating limits to uh, justice for child Sex Abuse Victims Act of 2021 will also be considered today. This bill would enable survivors who were victims of over a dozen federal child sex abuse offenses to seek civil damages in federal courts, no matter how long it has taken the survivor to process and dis disclose the abuse he or she suffered. Delayed disclosure has historically impacted survivors' path to the justice that they deserve. 
we can't deter children in any way from speaking out against their abusers. We know from the Larry Nasser case and many other tragic examples that it can take years for survivors to muster up the courage to come forward. This bill sends a clear message uh, to victims of these horrendous crimes that we see, we hear, and you, we support you. Uh, now I'm going to go to something that the Justice Department's sick and tired of me talking about, but I'm not in talking about it. I'd like uh, also to discuss examples of the Justice Department's failure to respond to this committee's oversight request. On February 3 last week, the Justice Department pur pur purported to respond to five of my oversight letters in a single letter. The department also noted that since January 20th, 2021, I have, quote, written or joined approximately 50 letters to the department, representing about one-third of all the letters the department received from members of the United States Senate, end of quote. Now, I doubt that Garland said that, that as a compliment. In that letter, the department noted that I provided a binder of unanswered letters to the Attorney General Carlin during his confirmation. And I simply did that so he wouldn't be blamed for a lot of things that the Trump administration didn't respond to. The department noted uh, that it responded to those letters. Now, in that case, the department is dead wrong. My staff made clear to the department last year that its so-called responses included one non-responsive, uh, number one, non-responsive letters that I've had for years. The department is essentially reissued the same letters. Second, new response letters that failed to fully answer the questions posed. You can put words on a piece of paper. That doesn't mean you're responsive. And third and last, the department failed to provide a single page of responsive records. As to the five letters the department said it responded to in that single letter, they failed there as well. As part of my and Senator Johnson's ongoing investigation into uh, uh, the uh, Biden family's foreign business deals, we asked for FISA information on Patrick Ho. You've heard me talk about Patrick Ho before. He was connected to the Chinese government's intelligence services. Hunter Biden reportedly represented him for $1 million. The department confirmed in federal court. Now, let me say that again. The department confirmed in federal court that it has FISA information on Patrick Cole. But the department wrote a letter to me and Senator Johnson saying that it couldn't confirm the same. The department again refused to explain why Attorney General won't say whether Nicholas McQuaid is recused from Hunter Biden's criminal case. Yet the department has publicly confirmed that other employees are not involved in other criminal cases. The department again refused to answer about Mueller team wiping their government phones uh, data. However, after pulling Keith to get documents from the department, it provided records to me. Unfortunately, those records were filled with improper FOIA redactions, and they didn't include the necessary spreadsheets. And I also want to know if career employees were consulted when the Biden administration said it's very weak crime policy, because if career employees weren't, then it would indicate possible political considerations infected the process. No answer on that question. As to my letter on COVID-19 and nursing home investigations, the department is hiding behind the policy that it doesn't comment on ongoing investigations. 
All we know, as we all know, the department can speak to ongoing investigations if they're in the public interest. So the Biden Justice Department has essentially taken the position that COVID-19 and nursing home deaths aren't in the public interest. Now, put, simply put, the department conduct is a complete embarrassment. Their conduct is a slap in the face to this committee. So Chairman Durbin, Durbin I'm say it again to this, again, this committee must assert its constitutional oversight authority on the Justice Department. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Uh, this recurring issue of response to letters, uh, we know that the department did respond, uh, and you noted that as well in your statement here. The department says that it received 50 letters from you last year and has responded to 40 of those letters as of yesterday. Uh, I am going to continue to insist that the department respond to every letter that they receive from you and members of the committee. Uh, and I hope that we can have a timely response to that. I'll also insist that the Department of Justice improve its responsiveness to questions for record. And, excuse me, Senator. It's an issue that has long served, uh, been, uh, has long been before this committee. I'll give you an example. By my staff's count from 2018 to 2020, 35 witnesses from the Trump Administration Justice Department testified before this committee, and questions for record were only returned from five of the 35. So the Biden uh, response has been better. We're going to hold them to an even higher standard. Uh, I hope that they will meet it. And 15, I, oh, 15 seconds. Sure, you got it. Those are words on a paper. They are not responses. And I've said many times, doesn't matter whether it's a Republican or Democrat administration, and I will, uh, will agree with you that Trumps didn't respond as they should, and maybe I wasn't fully uh, as, uh, as aggressive as you, as it makes it sound like I was uh, now with this department, but whether it's Republican or Democrat, I expect people to do it, and I've even stood up for Democrats in the Trump administration when they said they didn't have to respond to minority uh, or ranking member letters. And, uh, and, I, and I even testified in the House of Representatives that we were going to defend both Republicans and Democrats in that process. You are consistent and tenacious. We know it. I respect you for it. Thank you. I'd like to address one other issue that was raised in, in relation uh, to Andre Mathis by uh, Senator Grassley in his opening statement here. The statement is made that Mr. Mathis is not qualified because he had to refile several briefs with the Sixth Circuit in order to correct issues that they raised. In fact, it's been said if Mr. Mathis can't follow the Sixth Circuit's rules, how can we have any confidence that he can serve on this court? So we took a look at two specific issues, Case Berkeley versus Williams, 2021. It turns out that Mr. Mathis was asked to refile a brief in one case in order to make it a non-modifiable PDF as opposed to a modifiable PDF. That is one of the issues that's being raised about his disqualification from circuit court. Another case, United States versus Starks. Mr. Mathis's brief was missing a page designating the relevant district court document. The court asked him to refile the brief with the additional information. He did it. When he was asked about these things in appearing before this committee, he didn't pass the buck. He didn't blame a paralegal. He accepted responsibility for what was filed. Any of us who have filed legal documents before a court know that sometimes there's a deadline and a voluminous requirement, and we do our level best, and sometimes we miss a detail. These two are details that he complied with when the court asked him to, and I don't think are an indication that he is unqualified to serve on the circuit court. Does anyone seek recognition to speak on Mr. Mathis' nomination to the Sixth Circuit? The Senator from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mathis' nomination is precedent setting. This is the Biden administration's first circuit nominee in a state with a Republican senator, and in this case, it is two Republican senators. And the way the White House has handled this nomination from start to finish has made one thing clear, very clear. The Biden White House has eliminated the role of home state senators 
in the nomination process. And I'm not going to take up the committee's time rehashing the White House or this committee's process failures on this nomination. I will just say this. Senator Haggerty and I were not given meaningful consultation on the nomination. What we did hear from the street talk in Memphis was that the Senate was irrelevant, the home state senators were irrelevant. It is as simple as that. I know that some members of this committee feel that they were not adequately consulted by prior administrations on judicial vacancies in their states, and I understand that some of you are still upset about that and think that process arguments went out the window a long time ago. But this isn't just about lack of process. The consultation process exists in large part to ensure that we fill judicial vacancies with well-qualified, experienced candidates who were up to the task of upholding the rule of law. Mr. Mathis's nomination is a paradigm for what that process is needed. When the home state senators are not consulted, we end up with an unqualified candidate. I was finally given an opportunity to meet with Mr. Mathis personally earlier this month. It was after his hearing. And I've talked with some of his colleagues and friends, and it seems like he is a very nice man with a lovely family and a community that support him. But after reviewing the record, observing his performance at his hearing, and meeting with him one-on-one -on -one to discuss his knowledge and view of the law, there is no question in my mind that Mr. Mathis is unqualified for the position on the federal bench. I do have concerns about his ability to do the job of a federal appellate judge. During my one-on-one -on -one meeting with him, he couldn't answer basic questions about the Constitution, including the Second Amendment. He also wrote an article which Senator Grassley referenced, advocating for a freestanding actual innocence claim when it comes to federal habeas petitions. This would allow a convicted defendant to relitigate his case at any time if he believes he has enough evidence to prove his innocence. When Senator Hawley asked him about this article during his hearing, he would not say whether he still supported that idea. This is incredibly concerning to me and should be concerning to any member of this committee who cares about finality with the rule of law. Mr. Mathis has also never argued a federal appellate case. On the appellate briefs he has actually worked on, he's been the local counsel. Mr. Mathis is not the lead attorney handling the substantive appellate issues. He's the local counsel in charge of ensuring compliance with the local rules. And of the nine Sixth Circuit briefs that you had previously mentioned, Mr. Chairman, he's worked on eight. Eight were kicked back for failure to follow the local rules. That is eight out of nine. His job as local counsel was to comply with the local rules. Perhaps even more telling is the fact that his own clients don't see him as an appellate lawyer. When a case he is working on goes on appeal, his clients bring in other appellate lawyers to handle it. That can only mean one thing. His clients don't trust him to handle appellate matters before the Sixth Circuit. In fact, his own firm doesn't see him as an appellate lawyer. Butler Snow, where Mr. Mathis is a partner, does not list him as part of their appellate practice group. If his own clients, his own firm, don't trust him to handle appellate work, how can we trust him to handle appellate cases on the Sixth Circuit? It would be a disservice to the people of Tennessee and to the people of the other Sixth Circuit states to give him a judge with lifetime tenure who is clearly not qualified. I ask all of my colleagues to remember this. One day soon, maybe sooner than you think, they very well could be in a position 
that I'm finding myself in. One day there might be a vacancy in their state and the White House will try to fill it with a patently unqualified candidate whom they hope will do their bidding on the bench. I ask you all to stand with me today to preserve the integrity of the federal bench. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, before I recognize Senator Kennedy, uh, I want to enter into the record a letter from that same Butler Snow law firm uh, that uh, Mr. Mathis works uh, in of January 7th, 22, 2022, and to quote it in part, and I quote, that Andre has distinguished himself as a trial lawyer at our firm where former U.S. attorneys and fellows of the American College of Trial Lawyers lead our litigation practice is significant. In an era of disappearing trials, Andre has had 19. He has also 